Is there audio now, Kevin? Oh, bugger. <laughs> Did I just do that again? Oh, my God. All right. We have to start from the start. Go for it. From the top. From the top. <laughs> do we have anybody left? Is there anybody actually left watching? My I was God. reading the comments. I was like, what do you mean there's no audio? Oh, see, oh, it, listen, it's, it's been a long 24 hours. <laughs> And come here, I got my catchphrase right and everything. <laughs> like, I actually nailed my catchphrase today. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, what, what do we... What do so, we look, we, we, we'll start from the Conor McGregor <laughs> and Dustin Poirier fight. Oh, not again. again. You're going to make me relieve it again. <laughs> oh, good hell. Yeah, look, we, we were just commenting on... Uh, Liam made a point about that Dustin Poirier looked... Um, his game plan was perfect. Uh, took him apart with leg kicks... And when he got him against the cage, smelt the blood, he went in for the kill and never yeah. let up. Yeah, and, and I was saying just as credit due to, to uh Poirier that, you know, as soon as he as soon as he had McGregor's back defence, as soon as he landed that leg kick and he smelt blood, um and, and he knew that the time was now, he poured it on, didn't let up at all, um, didn't give Connor a chance to recover, um and just finished the job. And like the credit is more so due because this was a fully prepared uh, McGregor, like, uh, uh, and and that's not trying to make excuses for the Khabib fight. Uh, just yeah. saying that there was, there 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 could have been some doubt, but there in this case there are absolutely no doubts. This was uh, a, a finely tuned McGregor. He had a fully great camp, prepared. fully prepared. Weight was no issue. Um, distractions were no issue. He did. He he was as. As well prepared as he's been for any contest um, that he's been in his whole career, and Dustin still did the job, and that makes this victory for Justin all the all the sweeter yeah, and all know. the more impressive as well. And all the more impressive, absolutely, one hundred percent. And just before the audio was came on, <laughs> I was touching on giving credit to to, to um, Map or not Map Brown, Jesus Christ, Mike Brown, um, and the game plan. Mm. Uh, it, it like Kevin's at the point out there. Dan Hardy's pre-fight assessment was spot on with the leg kicks. Um, yeah, look, Mike Brown's one of the best in the business. He got it absolutely perfect. The leg kicks picked him apart and did enough damage for Dustin to be confident in that in that boxing range. Mm. Um, made McGregor flat-footed, and a couple of people commented on it that he looked flat, mm. and and that's not because McGregor came in came in flat. He was just he his legs were compromised and. He I don't know. I, he I, wasn't bouncing. I, I'm not sure if I agree that. Uh, I I I'm not sure if I agree with where you were placing the cart or the horse here. Yeah, that's a very. But, uh, yeah, I like <laughs> it. But do, do you? So do you think he did? He did come in a little bit more flat footed than I he think usually he came would. In, I think he came in with a boxing stance. Yeah, and uh, we didn't see McGregor kick from the off. That he he nearly always yeah, yeah. throws some sort of wild combination the of spinning, kicks early the on. The hook kick came after four minutes. Yeah, yeah, and and it wasn't even like it was just kind of thrown out there. It wasn't yeah. it, it, like it wasn't. He knew it wasn't going to land. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, like he he wasn't he wasn't in his regular um, kicking stance, and I I think that made him more susceptible to leg kicks. Uh, now he did check the first couple, and he said that um, in the post fight in presser that. The deadness came from the muscle on the front of his shin, not necessarily yeah. the calf, which is interesting. Um, that's worrying for but anybody who's trying to defend the calf kicks from here but on. But Dustin in. Poirier, in his post-fight presser, said that he could feel him trying to check them, mm. but he wasn't getting his leg out far enough. Okay. So that when he was digging in, he was still digging into the muscle. Okay. That that was Dustin's take from it. He could still yeah. feel. That's and you are going to feel that in a leg kick as well. If you're digging into the muscle or the shin bone, you're going to feel it 100%. Yep. So he just wasn't checking them well enough. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. But I like no, there's there's like literally nothing that you could take from Dustin Poirier for this whole thing. It was phenomenal, and a, a, like a, a brilliant capstone to a phenomenal career. Um, yeah, do you know he, he's the ultimate comeback story. He's three and zero now in in rematches. Yeah, um, like he's avenged all his re, his losses in the UFC. Uh, no, Has he? Apart from Khabib, no. Apart from Khabib and Michael oh no, Johnson, I, sorry, I I I misread his. He's three and zero in the rematches that he's had. He's, he's got had, other yeah. rematches to yeah, have. Yeah, yeah. But, sorry, um, yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, no. But you, you wouldn't bet against him in any of those rematches. Not man, not anymore. Anyway, I well, bet against him last night. Lost my may, shirt. <laughs> maybe you might bet against that's him. That's why I'm wearing Khabib, the same clothes today. <laughs> yeah. 
So we have 10 people on the line today. So um, any other comments there? What What do you think is next for um, Connor or Dustin at this stage, guys? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start out what do you think is next for Connor because we do have on the Facebook page today, we put up what do we think is next for Connor. We might get into a few of those. Or for Dustin, we might get into a few of those comments. Okay. So let me just pull those up on screen there. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it's one of those those big events that there's a certain expectation about, and and all the way up almost to the co-main event, it, the the, ca- the card was a little bit flat. That's the yeah. So, so but, this is the it, com- this is the post that you're talking about anyway. Yeah, but the co-main and the main lived up to it. It was uh, it was fireworks. So just read it out there from 2014 to 2021, Dustin Poirier. Oh yeah, it's just a picture of the difference between the fights 2014 to 2021. Mm. And then it's Dustin Poirier has become the first man to finish Conor McGregor with strikes. Uh, two questions, where where do you see Conor or Dustin going next and what's his next opponent and where do you rank him in the pound for pound rankings? So Dave Ellis says, Dustin V. Oliveira for the belt. Poirier was on the money, in my opinion, about uh, Chandler and getting a title shot after one UFC fight. Uh, uh, he needs a couple more, but if Connor needs fights to build up, I wouldn't mind watching him v. Tony. Yeah. Yeah, Connor v. Tony is a good shout. This is the thing that's still Connor a Connor v. Gaethje is a good shout. Connor, Connor v. RDA. Nate. Connor v. Um, yeah, Connor has loads of options. Yeah. And I think the next time we watch Connor fight, it, it'll be even more nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to. I don't know. I'm gonna have to get some Prozac for the next fight. I think. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Has he ever lost two in a row? Uh, in McGregor? his MMA career, no. No. Well, unless you count, no, no, because he didn't. Not in MMA, no. Did he come back from? Did he come back from Mayweather to fight Khabib. Uh, Khabib? Yeah. So that would be two losses in a row, but not in the same not, sport. Not in MMA, yeah. Mm. So. Yeah. It would it would be a tough one to go on to, yeah. In, in twenty twenty one, yeah. But that's a good shout there, Dave. Um, Joe, uh, Joe was on the stream with us last night as well. Um, great fight, uh, to Poirier or for Poirier maybe with the kicks that led to the final strikes to end the fight. Next could be Oliveira. I hope Dana and UFC don't hand it to Chandler before this fight. He's at number nine p- uh, pound for pound. It will be interesting to see where they rank. Dustin now. I reckon he's moved up to about seven or six anyway. Uh, Chandler, is it? No, no. Uh, we're talking about pound for pound rankings. Oh, pound for pound. Oh, sorry, Dustin yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Poirier versus Maximilian Meyer says Poirier versus Oliveira for the belt. Anything else would be stupid. And Chandler versus Gaethje. Now those are some good fucking fights. I like that as well. And similar make it on the same card like they did, but have both of them five rounders for goddamn sake. Chandler versus Poirier for the vacant belt put Charlie Olives on deck in case one of them drops out. I think that would be harsh for Charlie, Charles Oliveira. I think he yeah. deserves a a main event or, or or a big fight at this stage. He's worked for it and putting him in as a as a kind of a an alternate, I think um doesn't do him justice. Dwayne Biller says Connor looks like cowboy, that's what you get when you're inactive. Uh, it's a strange one, yeah, the comparison point. because he yes, similar enough to Cowboy. But Cowboy is always active. Yeah, Cowboy was never inactive. No. Yeah, but I, 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 he's comparing him to him. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. saying that's what you get when you're inactive. Yeah. Um, maybe Gaethje versus Nate. I thought that was the fight that they were trying to make when they said that Nate was coming back at 55 in a fun fight. But I think now that Connor is in the mix again, it could be Gaethje versus Connor just as easily as it could be Nate versus Connor next. And Connor's going to have to brush up on checking leg kicks if he's going to face uh, J- Justin, Justin Gaethje. Justin Gaethje. Ooh, Jesus. Yeah, that all of a sudden turns into a very difficult matchup. With some live comments there. Um, we have comments from two streams coming through here, so so bear with us, guys. Can you we, see? I can't see these. Yeah, comments. we have Stephen Looney who's back on with us again. He says Connor versus Nate next. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan, Coach Sutcliffe is a great coach, but they may have went with the boxing style more than they maybe should have. I totally fully agree, agree there, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. Um, and Stephen Looney again, Dustin versus Oliveira and Chandler versus Gaethje. I like all those matchups. To be fair, Dustin, Dustin yeah. and Charles Oliveira. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the fight to make, and I think that's where most people's heads are at. I just, I'm concerned about Dana putting so much emphasis on Chandler right now, and he, that he did get such an amazing performance that he will jump the queue. Yeah, I think, I think he does. I, I, I think they're going to put him. 
And our arch nemesis set <laughs> Chandler for the belt, no other fight to make. See that 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 that's is going to be a popular position. Yeah. That's going to be a popular opinion. Do you yeah. know, I don't think we can argue with any any of these top four or five guys fighting for the belt at this stage. Yeah, like, there is such a dirt between um, uh, Habib and the rest. The of, rest, yeah. you know, like and had Connor starched Dustin uh, last night, then we would be kind of looking at the Connor Khabib a rematch no it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever yeah, yeah. Um, and there will be people that will argue that it didn't make sense even before last night yeah. but now it makes absolutely no sense no. at all yeah. um, Connor's going to have to get through at least Gaethje at least uh, another two now at this stage at least two yeah um, and it's it's a it's a longer road back but it's interesting touching on that what, that uh, Chandler situation that right after the boat and Dana's presser he came out and someone asked him the question and he said Yes, Poirier and Chandler is the fight to make, and he was yeah. very. Yeah, he was, he was pretty me. much. He was pretty much. He was dead set on it. Yeah, and then as if completely forgotten about, someone said, "What about Charles Oliveira?" And he backtracked immediately and went, "Oh, you know, I don't make fights on the night of a yeah, fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not saying that it's Chandler versus Poirier." Yeah, so he he's look. He goes about his business, but he's kind of the forgotten man in that all the time. Mm. It's a rough one for him. There's a popular comment here from Richard Metcalf, and I think it echoes somebody else up up the line there. I think uh, actually Stephen Looney mentioned it as well. It should be Poria versus Oliveira for the championship, and Gaethje versus Chandler for the co-main. But God damn it, make it a five rounder! I know I was given yeah. out about this, and the, f- the co-main got finished in the first round. Mm. But can you imagine if that had been a three round war, and someone felt aggrieved at the end of it? Would it? They should uh, at, with those stakes. There should always be another two yeah, rounds yeah. involved. No, agreed. Agreed. Um, so Richard Metcalf got a lot of love for that for that particular comment. I don't think anybody disagrees with you. So um, yeah. if Joe Silva pulls out, Richard, you're in. <laughs> so jo, d- d- isn't Joe Silva long gone? <laughs> no, it's Joe Silva and Mick Maynard. Is he? Yeah, but is Mick Joe Ma- Silva gone? I don't think one he is. of them is gone. Who's the older boy? Yeah, Joe Silva was the original guy. Like. Yeah, he's gone. He's long gone. Is he? Who was the other fella that was there with Joe Silva? Um, uh, I can't think of his fucking name. Bugger. I forgot this the last day as well. It was the same send it in in the comments, yeah. The, yes. the, the, set, the set is typing away frantically here, giving out to us now. <laughs> it's the guy that signed... Um, Sean Shelby. Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, and Stephen Looney, why? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, Joe Silva's long gone. Joe Silva's so Sean, Sean Shelby was the one that signed McGregor to, to 145, yeah. and uh, Joe Silva was 155 and above. And Mick Maynard knows after taking over the heavier divisions, as far as I know, and Sean Shelby is 155 down. But I could be wrong in that. Kevin saying, I don't think we have ever seen such a traffic jam at the top of uh, a division ever. Makes for a great year ahead. Absolutely, 100%. But this, this is the big thing now. They need to get it done quick. So they're booked out for March. I would go with April or May for the lightweight title and get it on the line so that there's there's nobody clamouring and there's no more who should it be, this guy, that guy. Get it done in April or May and have a one, number one contender fight around the same time. Mm. Yeah, no, it's... Uh it's going yeah, to be a fun year. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I would agree. Now, just on, on that point... During the fo- post-fight presser, uh, Dana White did mention that because of the change of, uh, of administration in the U.S. with mm-hmm. Biden now as president, that there could be a clampdown on travel within the U.S. and therefore um, U.S.-based shows may be few and far between for the year ahead. Also hinting that he might even move to Abu Dhabi. Which would almost eliminate all American fighters. It would, it would certainly reduce the number of shows in America. No, know. but I'm saying, if if Biden's going clamping down like he says he is, would they be able to travel to the UAE and back for fights? Um, I'd say, well, I, I think they're going to be able to travel. I just, I think they're going to be in the same boat as like a, a Dan Hooker who is now six weeks from home. Oh, uh, yeah. Do you know, so if they're going but to Vegas, they would have to come into Vegas two weeks ahead, like a fourteen day quarantine, and stay but there. If, and if that's the case, they got to just get it done. Yeah. Like, I I don't see the UFC letting up at all this year. Like, you look at last year, they had the small few weeks off, mm. and then they went 25 weeks in a row, back-to-back-to-back shows, mm. to get there, because they have a, a deal with ESPN that if they get 40 shows, yep. they get paid the stipend, year-end stipend, that, that's their agreed fee. Yeah. If they don't get the 40 shows, they don't get that money. 
So that's the reason we saw 25 shows at the end of the year back to back to bring it up to about 43 or 4. Mm. Um, so I can see him just pushing through and rattling off cards every other, every week or every other week for the foreseeable. Yeah. And whoever they have around. And then they'll just pay the big money to fly them in for the pay-per-views. Yeah. Be a big change for the company though if Dana did move to, to UAE. Like it would, it would mean that like a lot of the superstars over the next few years would come from China, Russia... Um, yeah, there'd be a know, lot of stars come through from there. Yeah, jumping yeah. in on late notice and yeah, yeah, and you, you have you have an awful lot of fighters. Like, there's already a trend of fighters kind of heading off out to the Middle East for long training camps. Like, kind of what we would see in Muay Thai for uh, mo- for guys just moving off to Thailand, Thailand for yeah. for three months at a time. Yeah. Now you're seeing countless numbers of fighters just heading off to the Middle East, getting jobs as as coaches and gyms in, in various places around uh, UAE, Dubai. Yeah. Um. Uh. Like Bahrain. Bahrain. So yeah. do you know. Um. I, yeah, it's kind like of like the Dana kind of hinted that it's just the new home of MMA, and he's suggested it a couple of times. But, but here, it seems out, to be leaning that direction. Shout out to the Middle Eastern um administrations for for putting themselves in this position because like a couple 100%. of years ago, a couple of years ago when um uh, KHK like Brave yeah. came on the scene, um and uh. The, the Prince of Bahrain, um, he invested a huge number, a huge amount of money. First off, he he created Brave. Yeah. Um, then he uh, paid for the IMAF Championships to be hosted the world to host the World Championships in, in Bahrain, Bahrain three years in a row. Um, and each time he brought um. No 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 sorry. He brought each time he brought uh, uh the 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 World Championships. He created a fight week in the country. Kind of like a Las Vegas fight week. He created like yeah. a, a Bahrain fight week, and he had like like anytime we UAE were at the world, there was brave events. Yeah, there was ground. huge, huge uh, activity for an entire week, and all the TV stations were tuned yeah twenty four seven to the MMA events, even though they were only amateur fights, you know. Um, and at the time, I remember thinking, this is never going to last. It's not going to work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How can you possibly take the home of MMA out of Vegas? How could you do it? Well, and here we t- are. It took a pandemic, but <laughs> t- <laughs> we've certainly moved closer. A hundred percent. I, I like yeah. even even now, if the pandemic, uh, like w- not if when the pandemic settles down, like Abu Dhabi or UAE is still another hub that almost yeah. matches Vegas at this stage. Yeah, Do you know, and and, and and on that point, Steve Miocic is putting his belt on the line in March against Francis Ngannou. Now, there's a couple of title fights before then with Americans challenging, but if Stipe loses his belt, there's no American champion for the first time in over a decade in the UFC. That's that's crazy as well. Mental. That's crazy Shows as well. the change of the sport. Yeah. Remember when it used to be all Brazilian champions? It w- there was a shift from all American to all Brazilian, but then it slowly went back to all American, and yeah. it, then it started, it, only in the last five or six years, it went worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, And, and that was always one of Dana's... Um, goals as well was to make a worldwide sport he he always yeah. talked about that being like the biggest sport in the world being as big as soccer or um golf or whatever you know um and man it's getting closer every year Do you know we're realizing this this kind of worldwide spread we're seeing a lot of nationalities now national flags in the octagon yeah. it's good we've to got see a it. bunch of comments coming through there again so let's put them up and let's see what we've got um so you're going back as far as um casey Stephen. terry Stevie, yeah. Stephen Looney says, how about Connor versus RDA if Nate doesn't come back down? And I'm all about that fight. But again, Connor's going to have to do something to correct those leg kicks because RDA can snap them in as well. Yep. Very dangerous. That's, that's a tough fight. That is yeah. a, that, that's t- that, would, that was always going to be a tough fight. Um, but I think, um, see, th- this is the thing now. Is, is Connor now the Connor that bounces back um, from losses new and improved or have we kind of crested that hill um like th- that's that's what it makes that that's what makes this next conor mcgregor fight so exciting in my opinion i'm going to like i'm literally going to be i, I i'm gonna have to go to a psychiatrist before a, a conor mcgregor so no, fight again no, no fight companion for that one i don't think <laughs> I, th- I think you're gonna have to get someone else for the fight companion because i'm no more good after last night yeah it's a good job i'm not hanging from the ceiling right now like <laughs> yeah so look um it, a very good fight. It'd be an interesting one. And touching on what you said there about Connor coming back, like the the, the money is going to have to play a factor at some point. He was motivated by competition. We get that, and and the motivation is still there. Mm. 
but when when you're that singular minded motivation is different like when he mm. came back from the first night lost and just to <coughs> come back and be well, I think that he, guy, he and that's everybody be, else underestimated that's Dustin this time. I think he'll learn yeah. from that. I, I have yeah. I have faith in him to do that. I do, I do think he'll be back. It's just going to make it m- more nerve-wracking. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not saying that he is going to be um, over the crest. I'm just saying the thought of maybe he is is going to make yeah. it um, more exciting to watch. Casey Terry says, Connor versus Diaz 3 and Poirier versus Chandler. Those are good fights to make. Yeah, I fully agree. And Rob O'Driscoll is asking, is there even interest in the Diaz trilogy that was four and a half years ago? Like... Wouldn't be interested in myself anyway. <laughs> Give you're, away his nationality there. You're right to a certain extent, Rob. But here's the here's the thing, right? The minute that gets booked, and the minute the boys sit down and do a press conference, or do they cut any kind of promo from previous press conferences, everybody's on board again. Mm. You can guarantee it. Do you reckon it'll be the same uh, deal with uh, Poirier, where where the two of them are super respectful to Absolutely each other? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> you're talking about Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz is going to come in. He's going to talk about him butt touching or whatever he was on about the last time. He touch butt in the park. Yeah. It, Nate Diaz isn't going to hold back. He's going to be like me and you, me and my team versus you and your team. It, it's going to go back to the old one. They, Connor, those guys just that's their energy. I don't think that will change at all. Kevin says, "What, what else would they be doing with all the money?" Dana said he was in the process of buying a house there. Um, probably has it already. Mm. Uh, that's the talk in moving to to um, Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And actually, Kevin lived in Bahrain. Did he? He grew up in Bahrain. He made oh. his first Holy Communion in Bahrain. Do they do Holy Communions in Bahrain? They they do. Fair enough. There might be some sort of other uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, parts dunk, to the ceremony. Ducking his head in a river or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Casey Terry, replying to Rob O'Driscoll, yes, definitely. Connor still brings it up. It's a good grudge match. Both guys are coming off losses as well. Very true, yeah. And I, that, I like seeing this as well. Casey replying to somebody else in the comments. Yeah. Guys, you don't have to wait for us to re- reply to these. Chat amongst yourselves. Have like at we, it. Do you know what I mean? If you want to tear each other a new one, by all means, go ahead and we'll just get the popcorn yeah. and, and uh, kind of commentate on, on We'll on have a watch debates. along. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you can entertain us. Um, I look, we have to touch on the co-main event. You, Michael Chandler versus Dan Hooker. Uh, you had picked Chandler in this one, so I want to get your <coughs> impression of how good he looked. Um, yeah, I mean, he looked he looked awesome. Yeah, uh, uh, he. Sorry, I just had to fix the camera here now. But um, yeah, no, he looked he looked awesome. He he looked uh, fast. He looked uh, explosive, which you know. Yeah, uh, that, that we we knew that was going to be the the case anyway. Um, uh, Hooker looked tentative. He looked yeah. uh, uh, kind of uh, a little bit nervous to engage. Um, and Chandler used his explosiveness to cover the distance very very fast, yeah. which is that th- that's that's what I that's what I kind of felt was was the key to this was the distance covering, uh, the explosiveness and the ability to cover that distance in a short space of time to land those power shots. Um, but having said that, I think I, I don't think um I don't think that's a battle testing. No. But we did say that this was a litmus test to find out where he was in the division. Mm. And I want to ask as well, are we seeing Chandler hitting uh, some form of Indian summer in his career? Because that's three first round KOs mm. in a row mm. after the last two um I don't think so. I think I I, th- I think they're just coming to their prime. You know, yeah. early thirties is prime for an MMA fighter. He's mid thirties. He's he's older than me. Let's get topology out and fig- figure out. Please exactly tell where me he's, he's older than me. I thought he was like thirty three, thirty four, but I'm hoping he's older than me, lads. I'm going to be depressed off. I'm going to be as depressed as Liam if he's not older than me. Man looks older than me. That's a <laughs> and that that's that's not easy to do. Uh, hold on, now. so I'm just putting Michael Chandler on screen here, guys. So here we go. He is thirty four. Thirty four. Yeah, he's seven. So seven months young, older than me. I'm happy enough. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I still think like he is he is in in the prime of his condition. Yeah. Um. So, I I don't think it's it's as much an Indian summer as a coming of age, and I think um Poria is in the same boat. I think he's he's the best the best he's ever been. I think. Yeah. 
McGregor is in that it, with a bit more activity and with with a, a kind of a, a change of game plan. I think he's. He, I, I think we're looking at all of these guys. I think RDA might be gone past it a little bit. Yeah. I think Hooker is uh, is coming of Into age. It. Yeah. He, he maybe not at his peak yet. Um, whilst we got Oliveira, I think again has another couple of years before he reaches his peak. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think we're we're Max, looking at Ma- the golden. Max Holloway head. has a decade to reach his peak. By your <laughs> <laughs> Max Holloway is still going through puberty, by yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, no, I think I, I think we're watching the golden era of the lightweight division right now. But <coughs> excuse me. So you look at other sports and athletes. They kind of they give that range of from the age of about twenty seven to thirty one as your athletic peak. So you saying that in fighting it's different. Your peak is kind of the thirty to thirty five. <coughs> Absolutely. Age. And the reason is because it takes a minimum of 10 years to become a master of any um, sport. Yeah. And MMA guys have to master jiu-jitsu, wrestling, and striking. And That's fair. If if they were just boxers or if they were just jiu-jitsu guys, well, then that 10 years would happen within their, we say, late teens to early, uh, like to, to late 20s or, you know, in, in that period. Yeah. But when you're doing them all in parallel... Well, then the 10 years becomes maybe 14 or 15 years if you're trying to do all three. Do yeah, know? of course. Yeah. There is a certain, there, there's absolutely a crossover. And I mean, if you're physically fit for one, then you're physically fit for a, a good chunk of the rest of them as well. Yeah. Um, but to combine a mastery of all of those, the 10 years goes to 12. 14, so even when, years. even when they're in their absolute peak, they're still, they're still evolving. They're still evolving. I mean, like you, you can see, you can see even, um, some of the some of the guys that have crossed over from wrestling, um, like Chandler being one now, but uh, yeah. some of the pure wrestlers like Henry Cejudo, yeah. like um, like even Daniel Cormier or, or or these guys, who had already done their ten years yeah. becoming master wrestlers and, and masters of their sport, and then, then had to put it a couple time. of years later, then you see the peak of their striking uh, added yeah. on top. Do you know, and when you add uh, the peak wrestling with the peak striking, suddenly you have a whole new animal. Yeah. Um, and I think Henry Cejudo is probably the best example of that. Yeah. Um, GSP would be another one. Yeah. So he, uh, from the other, uh, the other from direction. From the striking to the wrestling. To the yeah. wrestling. Do you know? Yeah. So. Uh, Casey Terry, there. Love what you guys are doing with the page. Thank you very much, Casey. Love what you're doing with the comment section, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> right back at you, bud. It's all love today. I feel um, better actually doing the podcast. I was very depressed a little bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Pull you out of your funk. Um, we touch, I want to touch on the Joanne Calder with Jessica Eye fight. This is quite mm. an interesting one because we, we were trying to score this as we went. And it's, quite, it's actually quite difficult to, if you're talking a fight companion, to score a fight. Like I, I generally will score the fights as I'm watching them. Yeah. But you're kind of in it and out of it. You're a little bit distracted watching comments, etc. But like we, I think we both had Jessica I winning the first round and we were a bit shocked when most people had Calderwood winning it. But I, I, I look back at some of the stats, I didn't get to watch the fight back yet, mm. but some of the stats, Calderwood was all over her. Significant strikes, strikes, volume, everything. Mm. Um, I landed some big strikes and kind of, she controlled a lot of the, uh, where the fight went in the first two rounds. But if you look at the stats, Calderwood did very impressive display. Yeah, no, I definitely had I winning the first uh, round and I couldn't, we couldn't get over. Um, there, there was some tweets going live on on the feed from, from yeah. fans that the UFC were showing on their on, on their feed, all saying 10-9 to Calderwood. And we were like, what? Yeah. What fight were they watching? <laughs> yeah. um, but this is um, this is something that, uh, uh, it, it's something that has to be repaired in MMA viewership and judging is that, there, there's still a lot of subjectivity to the um, scoring, yeah. And and that's um, I, who said it recently. Uh, Ariel Helwani said it recently about uh, since he has started uh, commentating or or covering the other. Yes, uh, is, yeah. is this is this no? But what other sport is he doing? NFL or is he doing NBA? He's doing one of the other mainstream sports in the states anyway. Not a and clue. he says that at the start of each year, all of the commentary teams. And all of the like the coaches and everything that they're all brought in for like a three or four hour seminar, yeah. And they're made sat down through this thing, and um, and the officials, the the, the officials board or yeah. the 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 commission or whatever it is, sit them down and say, look, these are the rules. These are yeah. the updates to the rules. This is how you score a game. This is this, that, and the other. And we have nothing of the sort in 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 MMA. Like we're not even sure from event to event whether someone can put one hand on the ground or two hands on the ground. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's too divisive. There's too many athletic commissions. 
each state in America has their own uh, uh, guidelines and, and rule sets. Mm. You go to different countries, they have different guidelines and different mm. rule sets. Someone somewhere down the road is eventually going to create one governing body for MMA. And that the rule set will be set in stone. But look, it, 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 un, until we get to that, this is unfortunately going to be the way it is. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, as well, is that... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to do two things at once here. Um, like Mark Goddard and uh, Big John McCarthy are, are kind of two of the referees that are kind of heading up a lot of these commissions. IMAF has a, a very good handle on uh, how the officials work yeah. Um. And and they're good at educating the coaches on on how to score the fights in 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 that realm. It doesn't really translate to the to the pro sport. And I I think Joe Rogan is probably one of the worst for for scoring um rounds because he's still scoring the way that they were scoring yeah like five ten years ago. Um. So just like 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 for for anybody watching in, and this is just like from from my experience as a coach at, at IMAF events. The only two things that that um, officials are looking for in IMAF tournaments is danger and damage. Yeah, danger being if you make somebody have to fight out of submissions or defend against submissions or 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 bad positions. Yeah. Well, then you're you're showing effective uh, grappling and you're putting your opponent in danger. And then damage is to do with significant strikes, not just strikes yeah. like pitter patter strikes and kind of touch touch button the park type of strikes. Don't count. Yeah. Like forget about them. Don't even don't even click them. Don't even don't even add them to a statistic. Unless oh. it's a Max Holloway who's pouring them on. But they were all significant strikes. I don't think that a lot of them weren't. They're kind of they're almost uh, a lot of them. There's significant strikes in there. Yeah. But a lot of the leading up ones are slaps and they're setups. Yeah. Yeah. They're setups. But and, they, and they count them all as significant. Yeah. But with that volume, it does add up. It plays a factor. But when you consider those two factors, significant <coughs> strikes or damage, yeah, and significant grappling, i.e., sub sub attempts, uh, bad positions, which is effective uh, grappling or or danger, danger and damage, only count those two things. Don't even look at uh, position. Who's who's in front of the cage or or with their back in the cage. Don't even look who's on top, who's on bottom, who's got guard, who's got clothes. It does. It matters not. The only time that any of those things matter is if you cannot separate them on significant uh, striking or yeah. significant uh, danger with the, with the grappling. And and that's the way I think we were we were scoring the the um But I said that last night. I score Jojo fight. cynically. Mm. I score cynically because I don't score a fight as I see it. Mm. I gener just completely subconsciously I score a fight as I think the judges see it. Yeah. I've j my brain has just learned to do that. <clears throat> so I'm scoring it as how I see how I think the judges see the fight. Yep. As opposed to I personally would score a fight based on damage. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. So we better catch up with some comments here. Um Casey Terry with a crying laughing face I think or just a crying face. He's getting emotional on us. Yep. Uh Calderwood's knees to the body were awesome change the fight. Yeah. Very 100%. very good. And and we set up going into that fight that we wanted her to go back to the Muay Thai and where she looked best. Yeah, and she definitely did do that. But that was the thing we w we were giving out about her uh, throwing single legs in the first round. Yeah, and but, then but she didn't kind of follow through on them. I noticed that she was picking at the leg. Yeah. to get in close. Yeah. and to get the the, the plum and the tie clinch and. But Jessica I was beating her then to the to the clinch against the fence, and she yeah. spent most of the first round again with her back against the fence, getting yeah. elbowed or or yeah. getting you know. Now I wasn't doing the damage on the inside; she wasn't landing si significant yeah. strikes, and, and, may and maybe maybe Calderwood we were was landing knees. Yeah, hundred percent. So, yeah. yeah, no, I'm I'm open to correction on this one. And so Kevin O'Sullivan says we have some fighters who have a brace style for years and then work on all the other areas. So what it is going to be like in ten years as more and more come through the program from the IMAFs. Starting to see it already, a hundred percent. And in ten years' time, it is going to be people that have developed all uh, facets of the game together. Mm. So, the sport is constantly evolving over the last ten years. But it's got even ten years in ten years' time, it's going to even be more so. When judging full contact, I have only scored significant strike with intent. Other shots by good fighters are used to set up those scoring shots. Yeah. yeah so that's what you you were kind of mentioning with on Max, Max Holloway. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I agree. But Kevin, do you, do you find when you're scoring a fight, you you just score it the way you would, or do you, when you're watching an event and it this high stakes fight, do you find yourself scoring it as you think the judges would see it, 
to try and get a better idea of how the fight is going to go? Because I know you, you've said that you would judge on damage, but a lot of the times in, in UFC, Bellator, all these events, you're looking at scoring and takedowns do matter. Takedowns towards the end of the round, even when a guy is getting beat, matter. And this is consistently the case. Mm. And cage time, all this counts. So anyway, uh, uh, after all the, the, whether it's a controversial decision or not, uh, Jojo moves on. Yeah. Um, is she, like... I, is she ready for a run at the title at this stage? Is she? Th- does this? Where does this put those two girls now in terms of rankings? So they were six and seven. You'd imagine JoJo is on deck for a top five next. Yeah. And you look at that time. You 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 have Jessica Andrade is about to. Well, Jessica Andrade is definitely next for Valentina for sure Shevchenko. Oh yeah. Um, and we have Lauren again up there. We've Lauren, Lauren Hill or Lauren Lauren Hill is Lauren Hill from the Fugees. <laughs> So yeah. I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, Lauren Hill can't fight. Um, or maybe she can. Never know. Never know. Um, yeah, so Chukagian. She has a loss to Chukagian. That might be one to run back. Uh, Jennifer Maya is up there. She has a uh, loss to Jennifer Maya. Maybe mm. one to run back, but they were both tough fights. Personally, I'd like to see her get in there against... Just keep the division moving forward and so that it's not the same opponents coming up against Shevchenko or swatting away new contenders mm. I would like to see Calderwood against Murphy mm. and the winner of that getting the shot against Shevchenko mm. so that it's fresh opponents for Shevchenko yeah. poor old get, Murphy I, I, like is not getting any break no but I, I think it's know she's about 63 isn't she <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a sensible move to make because if you put those two girls it's like what happened with Bantamweight recently when you had Jermaine Durandamy and Holly Holm on the same card against uh, two contenders Aldana and my memory's failing me now, but it was on the same card in 2020. And what happened was GDR and Holly Holm came out impressively on top. Mm. The last two girls to fight um, Nunes at Bantamweight. So mm. you're looking at a situation where it's kind of gone stale. Your, your two contenders that were up and coming through the rankings and had just hit that top five are now swatted away by the mm. gatekeepers. Um, you just don't want that happening again at 25. Uh, hopefully they've learned their lesson and they can get Calderwood versus Lauren Murphy done and you've a contender set in stone then. Mm. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Any other fights on the card that you want to have a have a talk about? Um, I just touching on Kevin Sullivan's comment there. So, when judging full contact, I have only scored significant strikes with the intent to shots. Oh, you read that out already, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah, I didn't Apologies. want to break I th- I th- the I thought he was replying to my. Um, you look so excited. Question, yeah. I said I'd leave you at it. No, he's leaving me hanging. <laughs> Cheers, Kev. <laughs> um, yeah. To be fair, the rest of the card look. Maybe it was just anticipation of what was to come, but the card felt a little flat up to that point. Mm. Uh, the only significant ones that stood out were Marina Rodriguez looked phenomenal. I was touching on the fact that Rebass in the first round did everything she needed to do to stay stay on top in that fight. Mm. She came out and tried to strike with her, and we saw how that went. And what and then Herb Dean had his Herb Dean had his ling- uh, limbo moment. Yeah, what was that? Mm. In and out, he was doing the what's that dance? <laughs> He did the limbo. Well, and he, then he, he left the fighters the limbo, in limbo. But it was left leg in, left leg out, left leg in. The hokey cokey. <laughs> the hokey cokey. <laughs> Fucking idiot. Yeah. It's, and it's uh, Seth, Seth the back, Bat Slayer uh, uh, wanted to kind of remind us that Herb Dean is the most inconsistent referee. <laughs> and uh, you, of course, then posted uh, that he's generally consistent. Yeah. yeah. And then Seth uh, posted back, shaking my head. Yeah. Okay. For me, still, <laughs> he he's one of the more consistent ones. I have to say that I just from what I've seen, he's the more more one of the more consistent. Ones. I believe I do actually have a reply off Kevin O'Sullivan. You do. Wacko rules are specific in ring sports, and you so you only score what you see directly, and what is accurately striking and a scoring area with intent. Who is in the ring is not important. You doing your job is mm. fair enough. Yeah. So you score wacko kind of. Yeah, and just for anybody who's not familiar, Wacko is the world kickboxing body. Yeah. That's really kind of uh, the, the the like if kickboxing gets to the Olympics, it's going to be under Wacko rules. Yeah. Um. So they would be, um, the the amateur association worldwide. Um. Yeah. So uh. So yeah, Rebas is uh, her train has been derailed. I wouldn't um, say derailed, but it certainly had to. Yeah, it's a big win for Rodriguez. It was a, it was an upset. It should, uh, yeah, it, 
It was. They're both contenders, but um, I think there was def- certainly more hype on Rebas. Mm. Um, I don't think she's derailed by any means. I think she'll be back, but uh, it certainly puts Rodriguez in the picture. Yeah. I have my partial scorecards here for most of the fights. <laughs> As I was watching uh, the fights, I was kind of like, uh, I-, I was planning on scoring them, and then we got too wrapped up in like doing the fight companion that I, I forgot to put it down. And talking shit. And talking basically. absolute rubbish. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, you also had uh, McMahon and Juliana Pena, Sarah McMahon, Juliana Pena. Yeah, it was um, a good fight. It was, it was a great fight, yeah. Um, McMahon looked phenomenally strong. Uh, yeah. We saw her, her, her strength advantage in, in the clinch, her head position against the cage, phenomenal. Um, and such grit by Julianne Pena to come back in the third. It, w- it was interesting, because you, can you remember right at the very start of the fight, the first takedown, Julianne Pena actually had her hooks in, mm. f- but she was she was underhooked, and she was on yes. the bottom. But she somehow had wrapped her legs around and had hooks yeah, yeah, in yeah. as if she was on on. She had her back, back while still facing her. Exactly. Which is so crazy. So I, I, after watching that transition and the fact that Sarah McMahon just powered her way out of it, uh-huh. I didn't think for a second that Penny would have what it takes to get her back and choke her out. Mm. I thought McMahon would just kind of completely dominate the grappling exchanges and I thought mm. that's the way it was going to go. But Penny proved she's, an, she's a nightmare for most people on the mat. And big difference here as well between the uh, styles is that when McMahon had a, a dominant grappling position, yeah, she focused on the grappling yeah, yeah. When yeah. Pena had a dominant grappling position, she continued to strike. Yeah, and and and, and, and look for submissions. Yes, like, but she was she just kind of had it all. She was kind of yeah, she was piecing it together. More active as and well. I think that's what opened up the the the, the submission attack. Do you know, yeah. whereas like when somebody is only grappling with you, you can focus on defending against the submissions. When somebody is is controlling you from a position and punching you in the side of the head, then suddenly. Like you leave gaps, you leave an underhook here, you leave your neck here, and you're trying to protect yourself, yeah, as well so, as defend. Yeah. And and that's like for any young fighters watching in or, or or watching that fight, that that's a huge lesson to take. And from a scoring point of view as well, again, um, we've got a lot of uh, young athletes um, who when they hit the IMAF stage and they they kind of get a a side control position, they put everything they have into holding that side control position, forgetting that the side control position or the half guard, or the f- close guard, or whatever it is, scores nothing. Yeah. The position scores nothing. The only thing that's scoring is danger and damage. So if you're in uh, a side ride, turtle top, um, you, you have you have someone's back, you're, um, you've got half guard, means nothing unless you're also striking or, or threatening with submissions. Sub- yeah, yeah. So uh, Juliana Pena uh, doing what's required to win um, uh, on a points basis, even though I felt that she lost the first two rounds. Yeah, definitely. But in in chasing what was scoring points wise, she unlocked the um, the rear naked choke and was rewarded handsomely with uh, a rear naked choke finish, yeah. and and a nice finish too. She she almost finished it one handed uh, because uh, McMahon had stripped the top hand, so she had like the rear naked choke with her with Pena had her hand on the top of Sarah McCann's head. Sarah McCann reached up and stripped that grip off, and then Julia Juliana Pena instead of letting this come all the ways out. She went to her own forearm, and she used her own forearm as the grip, yeah. and managed to finish it. Kind, not not exactly one handed, but kind of, kind of one handed. It was kind of a modified version. One handed with a bit of leverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I know it was. It, awesome. She was very, very impressive, and I, I honestly, even when she got to her back, didn't think that McMahon would be submitted like that. Mm. So it just makes it all the more impressive. Yep, uh, Brad Tavares and Junior. I uh, can't remember the Antonio rest, Carlos Jr. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, back and forth fight. Two lads taking chunks out of each other, but Tavares in the end was the... the like, we really, Jr. should have kind of engaged more grappling. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Did, I, I said it, it right off the bat. Yeah. It started a fight. He came out and he, he threw a couple of uh, combinations and I said, this isn't the fight that he wants to fight. Yep. But he seems to kind of get caught there mm. and, and not really look to take... Mm. Uh, he made a couple of attempts to bring it to the mat um, but not enough he should have been chaining takedowns together and trying to impose his will on the fight but he kind of played into Brad Tavares' game too much the other uh, so there was two other fights that I, I, I have any notes on uh, you might have more but uh, Nick Lentz and uh, Evluev early on um, Nick Lentz uh, dare I say he looked old 
Then again, he's, he made it competitive the first two rounds. Yeah. He just it just looked like that he was taking a lot, a lot, a lot of damage. And, this, and is, it was this is what was weird. Speed. This is what was weird. Again, I go back to, I was trying to score those first two rounds and mm. they were they were very close rounds. But yeah. obviously, the damage, and you could tell by Nick Lentz's face, mm. was going to Evloev. Mm. And that's why I was winning him those rounds. But Nick Lentz made it ugly. He was reaching for that guillotine over and over and over again. And that's putting putting someone in a bad position. Putting, yeah, so that's that that's why I had him winning the first round. In, yeah, in that like you know he, the two he, guillotine attempts were close. Yeah, he made Evloev defend himself, so he had Evloev in, in in danger, whether it was going to finish or not. Yeah, Evlu, Evloev had to respect that uh, sub attempt and therefore was defending. He was in danger. That's the, that's the that's the definition of being in danger if you have to defend yourself, you know. Yeah. Um. But then, like a, as the fight went on, he was just uh, just getting pieced up. Yeah. Taking an awful lot of damage, and um, I'm not sure how old uh, Nick Lentz is. This might, um, this might. Um Nick Lentz is 100 percent older than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just feeling old today, and sorry for myself. That's all that is. Yeah, so Nick, Le- Nick Lentz, I would guess is about 37 or 8. Okay, let me put it up on screen. We're on Michael Chandler right now, so let's go back. To while, while, while we're on that fight, though, Evloev is now 14 and all. He's had some tough fights already. That dude is going to be impressive at featherweight. Impressive. Yeah. Up. Hold on. I'm in the wrong place. You're there. 36 years old. Younger than I thought again. Yeah, not not too old, but definitely approaching the twilight of his career. 44 fights deep, too. Yeah. Yeah, A no, lot. he definitely looked it. To, to me, he definitely looked it. Um, yeah. And the fact that he kept going for the same guillotine as well, he didn't really adapt it. Apart apart from the fact that he went right-handed for the first round, left-handed for the yeah, second that, round. Yeah, that, that's just because his arm was <laughs> blown out from the <laughs> first two of Um I do want to touch as well on the uh, the Marcin Prachno versus Khalil Roundtree fight. The oddest scoring decision I've seen in quite some time. Yeah, I think we all had uh, Khalil Roundtree comfortably winning the first two rounds and then losing the last round. Yes, but they yes, gave we the did, decision yeah. to Martin. Yep, which was a bit of a shock to us at least. Yeah, it has saved Martin's career though. Yeah, like he was. On we a we said it game. before the, the decision was called that he's certainly going to be caught. Yeah, on four in the UFC. Mm. Um, but you've got to give him another chance now after that, mm. or do you? No, you do. You, you absolutely do because he like we were we were saying even saying that had he lost that by decision it would be a shame to cut him because he fought yeah. so well. He came back in that fight, and if there was another two rounds, you yeah. imagine he would have won that fight anyway. Like we we felt that he lost on the, uh, uh, he lost each of the rounds, but they were competitive all the way yeah. through. Yeah, definitely. Good good scrap. Um, but then again, one and three, and with all the talk that maybe he didn't deserve to take the decision to fight the way it was. Hmm. Still a tough one. He look. He, if he does get another fight, he's got to be impressive this time. Yeah. Um. And then you had Albazi in the for opening fight of the night. Look, damn impressive. Jesus, look damn impressive. Yeah, I I wasn't paying attention at all for this fight, so you're gonna have to take this one. The flyweight, the, the flyweight division. I've said it over and over again. Is just on fire at the moment. And I had Zum Zumagulov coming into this. Uh, looks look very promising. But Albazi just dominated him everywhere on the feet, on the mat. Um, very good takedowns, great transitions. <clears throat> just looks a real contender. No, there's, there's so many contenders there. One to thirty, one to forty could be contenders. So could be a while yet before he gets any kind of uh, contender fight. But mm. certainly one to keep an eye on in that flyweight division. Mm-hmm. And similarly, if you go up the card, the uh, the middleweight bout between Mahmoud Muradov and Andrew Sanchez. I thought that was top too early. <laughs> oh, the, yeah. I was there like, what are you talking about? You did this to me as well last night. We're watching this live. Guy gets pieced up and uh, did the worst stanky leg <laughs> we've ever seen in MMA. And Liam goes, no, nah, he stopped that too early. <laughs> so let, let me qualify what I meant, right? <laughs> so he 100% did the stanky leg. Um, yeah. But at the time when the ref stopped it, he was just about recovering. But one and minute now. He he parked himself back to the octagon yeah. with his two f- knuckles on his forehead yeah. and didn't move for a full 30 seconds. You can't not, not do that. Not 30 seconds. It was more like five seconds. 
You can't do that, though. No, I know, I know. I, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that it was a terrible stoppage. I think that one or two punches. I think he was on his way back to recovering. If, if he hadn't done the wild chicken stanky leg before, yeah, this had happened. I agree with you. Yeah, but the fact that he. Look like what what was Dave said the wibbly wobbly wonder <laughs> <laughs> in out in the open and then did that against the cage. You have yeah. to stop the fight because the guy's clearly concussed. You don't you can't have him taking repeated punches on the cage if he's concussed. That's not necessarily concussed, but I know I get you. If if a Stanky guy like no 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 but one minute now if a guy gets clipped heavy yeah and then after two attempts to put separate feet down. Yeah. Still can't find his balance. Yeah, that's as close to a concussion as you're going to get. Not necessarily. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't always follow. Do you know, you you can get clipped and you're you're like equilibrium you know, just set off completely. Yeah, you're like the shock of the impact could just kind of just have have things wobbling a bit but, for. But a But that's bit, fine. You know? That that wasn't shock of impact. Not mm. like he was just stunned. Mm. That was he was out on his feet and trying to. Well, his his legs feet stopped down. working, but his head was his his eyes were still focused. I'm gonna have to. It's, it's when the eyes, one. if when the eyes roll back, or when when you see somebody and they, they stare off into the distance, or they're not they're not looking at at somebody. I I would say that would be uh, more dangerous. Like we've seen, like I, 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 and I would call that a concussion poker face. <laughs> maybe 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 <laughs> so, but I mean, like if you have concussion or if if you if you're out out on yeah, your yeah. feet, you will not, no matter how hard you try, be able to focus on anything. You but know? but. Concussions don't necessarily aren't necessarily just when you go out. You can get concussions from punches that don't put you out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, not that. Yeah. Uh-uh. I just don't think that that was a concussion. And again, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not. I just to disagree, disagree with you. Okay. He looked. He looked all of the concussion trying to put one foot in the mat. <laughs> we were talking about Herb Dean with the left leg in, left leg out. <laughs> hockey, <laughs> cocky. There was a few of them doing the hockey, cocky last night. <laughs> so I think is that the full card. Um, well, the the only one we didn't touch on actually is the Armand Sarukian fight. Uh, the guy who missed weight and 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 twenty two hours notice had to step in against Mafravola, and he also looked phenomenal. Um, so uh, definitely an interesting one there as well to watch out at lightweight. Uh, and he got bumped up that card to because of Hexperast falling out his own mm. opponent, and because of what happened with Otman Azaitar. So. Great position for him to be in now. He got a bigger fight, more eyes on him. Whatever in all the shit that happened beforehand, there was a lot of talk before the fight. Mm. So he got all the right publicity and then picked up a huge win. So the o- the only downside, of course, missing weight. He'll have to correct that the next time. But yeah, impressive at lightweight. So perhaps another contender. We had no mishaps on the mic last night. Everybody made made use of their callouts. I believe uh, Chandler made a good callout. Chandler's was a little bit WWE. Yeah, it was rehearsed. But, but he still hit the main tree. And like you said after, yeah, 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 yeah. just as well he didn't come out and go, Connor, and then Khabib. And then leave out Dustin. Yeah. yeah like, no, he remembered Dustin. Like a lot, I, I, I don't think anybody had um, had Dustin pick to win that fight. So. No, and look at it. He's He made his case for the next shot. I think a lot of the people in, on our page here in the MMA opinion are kind of in agreement with us that maybe perhaps th- one more, one more, yeah, because it it's hard to overlook Charles Oliveira in the position he's in. Yeah, yeah, um, Oliveira has has certainly earned his position. That said, though, I I can see the UFC giving it to Chandler. Yeah, very very easily. Dana White don't listen to us. No, <laughs> Dana White don't listen to anyone. He we listens need to, to t- needle. We need to touch on this as well. If you were watching on the west coast of America last night, um, I want to know how long your stream dropped for. Mm. Your your UFC because that's the big takeaway and all the talk last night and today. Of course, you Dan, Dana and his post fight presser about the we got the guy, and next one we're gonna get another guy. Focus on your own. What's what's the expression? Uh, fix your own house first or something. Mm. I don't know. Mm. But yeah, get get your own shit together and then start focusing on who's watching on streams, etc. Um, absolutely appalling of a fight of that magnitude. That their own, no, that the, the onus there is on ESPN to make sure that's correct. But 
Yeah, but even even hurts like, both brands. Not just on the west coast of America, but also here in Ireland, it dropped it, the ball massively. Like BT Sports, it was Im- it was almost impossible for anybody in Ireland to to legally buy the fight. Yeah, almost impossible. Unless you have a particular um, Sky box in their their particular uh, TV provider they're, here. They're one of three or four different providers. Yeah, uh, like and ev- and everyone's kind of moving away from them because they're basically thieving bastards. Like it's a fucking. <laughs> It's a fortune to have Sky in the house. Yeah. But more people have been moving away from it for the last few years. And now all of a sudden you come watch that fight last night yeah. if you didn't have a Sky box. Yeah, yeah. Lunacy. And then in the UK, our next door neighbours who, similar situation, they were able to get it on an app and they were able to get it online mm. through a BT player. Mm. But that's not provided in Ireland. Yeah. The Conor McGregor fight. Yeah. Absolutely sickening. Yeah, so... the. the the UFC need to get their own house in order and make sure that people can actually watch the fights before they start going. Stop watching them illegally. Yeah, we were lucky we had a skybox here in the studio. Yeah. That's but our story and we're sticking to it. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, we want some comments here on this, guys. Um, and maybe for anybody who's watching in afterwards on a, on a playback, uh, we are considering doing um, a fight companion for one of the early UFCs, maybe one, two, three, four, or five. Um, and that in all its glory would you be interested in that would you watch it with us would you queue up your UFC Fight Pass subscription stick on UFC 3 and then just kind of watch it along with us would you be interested yeah. in that I, I, I'm actually, I actually I think that would be It'd good be fun good fun yeah and the thing is so it's, we're, we're aiming for next Sunday at this time our usual 8 o'clock show there's no fights on next weekend mm. so instead of doing a preview of the upcoming f- February card, the February 6th card, there's a little bit of space in between. So we're, we might touch on a few of the one fights that are happening during that time, if there's anything interesting comes out of that. But more so, and we'll be talking about what's going on anyway as we're doing the fight companion, if we're doing it. So it would mm. just be something interesting in, or be something different. If you're interested, let us know which one, UFC 1, 2, 3 or 5. And we want to keep it to that it range. No was there a UFC 4 now? Did I say one, two, three, five? Yeah. I definitely didn't. You definitely did. I'm going to watch like, that we, back we, later. Yeah, we have evidence like. I, I 100% said 4. <laughs> I can, you're, now, you're now all of a sudden telling me I can't count to 5. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be very troubled if I watch that back later and I missed 4 and I count to 5. Um, so yeah, let us know which one you want to watch though. One, two, three, four, or 5. <laughs> Cool, old school. Uh, uh, Kevin said, sorry for letting you hang there for a while with the response. At 50, I don't have the thumb dexterity as the younger folks when typing um, and predictive text is a bollocks. <laughs> well, predict, he said predictive text is, is a billow. A billow. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin O'Sullivan calling for UFC 4. Uh, just just because you'd missed it. <laughs> that's a good one. It's a good one. I like that one. as well. That was the... Um, Ken Shamrock versus Heist Gracie super fight wasn't I it? I can't remember any of the cards back then. So, I, yeah. I, the only uh, I, like as I was saying there um, in one of our previous episodes, the only reason I I uh, brought up maybe maybe doing the fight companion for the earlier ones was because uh, when you mentioned Paul Verdens last week, yeah. I went back and watched his fights, and I was shocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. shocked at the not only the the, the the difference in like how far the sport has come with regards to technique and um professionalism and athletes and and whatever but also the haircuts my god <laughs> the haircuts and the hairstyles and what the you fashion. were commenting on as well that we need to get into if we're doing this is the their little you know the vts the, the vts they do before their fights yes yes some of them are absolutely priceless so as uh, so like in in today's uh, mma world we have like the shows like countdown and embedded and they're like they're they're decent they're good but the equivalent back then in 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 early 90s was hilarious hilarious can't wait to get stuck into a few of those yeah i'm just going to um Go through some of the cards. So, UFC two was the second tournament. Heist Gracie won that. U- Heist Gracie obviously won the first tournament as well. UFC three was famous for uh, the two alternates coming in in the final and Steve Jenham picking that one up. Not to give too much away, but 
Uh, sorry, the UFC 4 was on Hoist Gracie fought Dan Severn in the main event. Yes, that was that was another tournament. Yeah. It has to be a tournament a anyway. One. If we're going to do one, it's, it's got to be one of the tournament-based uh, cards. Yeah. For me, it'd be one, two, or four, the ones the Hoist one. Yeah. Um, and you've Dan said the B7 coming in a four as well would be an interesting one. Number one would be hilarious as well because I, I remember uh, Bill Superfoot Wallace called the sport wrong like yeah, yeah, the sport yeah wrong a few different times and and, and not not whatever but the commentary team some of the guys that showed up the sumo wrestler guy who got his two kicked out yeah you had art jimerson with one boxing glove on <laughs> but you know that sumo wrestler he was hawaiian he he was in yeah. hawaii 50 was he yeah yeah he's an actor <laughs> in hawaii 50 not not the original series but the new yeah. series the reboot he's the guy that's selling shrimp on the beach in the in, in, ah, the, in the fish and chip shop that is hilarious. <laughs> I can't remember his name, but um, yeah, funny guy. Yeah, some, so, of, some of those matches were priceless. Yeah. So there you go, guys. I think uh, we're we're okay to wrap up. So we're yeah. waiting on replies from everybody about which, which show to do. We um, might put up a post during the weekend here, which was your favorite UFC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And whichever gets the most love, we might cover that next week. So that's it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, thanks for the support. Hope you enjoyed the show. Um, I know you enjoyed UFC 257, and we know you're going to enjoy the fight companion next week. So yeah. until next week, we'll see you then. And just touching on, we had a very busy week with podcasts going out this week. That's yeah. not going to be the case every week. We're just no. covering the big events, and there was two fight cards. So yeah. tune in next week when we're, when we're back on it. I want to fuck. I want to fight with Chuck. Fuck, Chuck. I think he just blew his wad there. Anderson Silva, you absolutely suck. Are you still drunk right now? Are you still drunk? Oh, wait, 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 wait,